Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of the second semester okay, at the Hebrew University's CS uh, Department Colloquium. Uh, we're very happy to have today with us Mark Silberman, Mark Silberstein. Uh, Mark is an associate professor at the Technion uh, EE department, and he's the head of the Accelerated Computer Systems Lab. Mark has done some fantastic work on operating systems, programming abstractions for emerging hardware, such as GPUs, FPGAs, and he's done very, he has done some very influential work on system security, including trust execution environments and defenses against high channel, channel attacks. Mark is the recipient of uh, numerous awards, including the ACM URSIS John Ludic Young Research Award last year. We're very happy to have him and excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, the stage is yours, Mark. Good luck. Thanks, Ilan. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really honored uh, to present our recent work uh, that has been done by my PhD student, Alan Rachelbach, with collaboration in collaboration with the Ori Rotenstrike from uh, Computer Science and Electrical Engineering Department. So just a few words about the lab that I'm uh, heading. Um, our core uh, activities are in operating systems and security. Uh, you're very welcome to visit our website. We have all our software also free and available. Um, and interestingly today, I will gonna talk about the uh, topic that is in the rightmost corner of this, um, uh, of, of this website. Um, this is the playground for interesting topics in search for new ideas and uh, somehow uh, this idea um, uh, started really small and then developed into something that I believe is going to be very influential for future computer systems. So uh, what are we going to talk today about? Um, I'm going to talk about an algorithm that performs range matching. Um, it has a bunch of applications. So going to cover the background for uh, current uh, algorithms. And I will going to talk about the ways to uh, make this algorithm more scalable with the help of uh, neural nets. And we'll show how to apply uh, and how this all works together uh, in the application domain uh, of packet classification. Uh, of course, all the background uh, is due. So I will, I will present all these uh, topics in a very accessible way. And finally, I will talk a little bit about future ideas because again, I think there are quite a bit of uh, new uh, interesting applications for this algorithms, uh, for this type of algorithms. Um, uh, there are abundant of those. Okay, so um, by the way, feel free to stop me at any point. I will be happy to answer questions as, as we go. Uh, okay, so let's start from the um, sort of definition of the problem. Uh, we want to do range matching, uh, and range matching is a very simple kind of uh, problem where you have a bunch of ranges given, um, and with every range there is a value associated with it. Uh, uh, for example, for for range uh, zero to seventy, there is uh, the value is six hundred. And so the input is uh, some kind of integer that um, needs to be associated with the value depending on the range. And so if that integer falls into the range, then it uh, will have the corresponding value. For example, 85 has um, a value is associated with the value 325 because it falls into the range uh, 80 to 104. And um, also another important point is that if you give an input that is not uh, described by any of the ranges or does, uh, does not match with any of the ranges, then the output should be nil. And this is the case for minus 10 in this case. Okay, so this, this is really, really basic uh, problem. And uh, it turns out that this um, uh, range matching is uh, in, lies in the foundation of uh, many um, parts of computer systems. Uh, we can think about virtual memory where we want to find the translation between the um, virtual address into physical address. Uh, we can think about network switches and uh, routers. Uh, this is 
is the topic that I'm going to talk today more about. Uh, but there are also file and storage systems. You can think about uh, mapping a file offset into a disk block um, uh, or if, uh, associating um, with a specific file. Uh, sparse data structures, you can think about uh, giving a absolute index in the data structure, giving me the I'm sorry, given, given the certain dimension of the data structure, given, uh, given me the specific physical location of the data. So, and even in DNA sequencing. So it's, it's really a very uh, popular <clears throat> uh, um, problem, right? Re re really a uh, common problem in, in, many, in many systems. <clears throat> and the traditional data structures that um, do uh, range matching uh, depend on the specific uh, um, uh, on the specific in input domain, right? So, for example, if we want to map a virtual to physical addresses, usually the pages are regular, and so it's very easy to know, given uh, a an absolute virtual address, how to map it into a particular physical page. Um, the, the the operation is pretty straightforward, uh, and you use radix trees for for those cases. This is a kind of page table, right? Uh, but there are also regular cases where you don't know exactly the size of the data that you are indexing. And in this case, you, you really need to use interval of trees. And even a more complicated case is when you have overlapping ranges. And this is what we are going to talk today about, where you have packet rules or like firewall rules that define which packets go into which port or whether they're dropped or not in, in the network. And in these cases, you really have pretty complicated data structure that is built on top of a hierarchy of hash tables um, and other uh, things that, that, that make actually the, the whole process of matching uh, much more complicated. Uh, but again, it's uh, kind of a common knowledge. There are a lot of algorithms that deal with this problem over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and uh, I believe that this problem is, is, is very well understood. Now, the, the, the real kind of interesting part here that, uh, that, that all uh, of these data structures, what they have in common is the fact that it is really hard to scale uh, the index. Uh, we, as, we, as we get more and more data to index, uh, the, whole pro the whole algorithm becomes really, really slow. And that is because of the fundamental architectural trend of uh, what is called memory wall. This is a constraint that we observe over the last 20, 30 years where uh, the, the, the memory uh, latency and bandwidth do not improve over time. In particular, memory latency, that what you care about most, to the main memory uh, does not improve. And therefore, um, every time you want to access that memory, you pay quite a lot in latency and CPU is stalled during that point, during that access. <clears throat> and the only way to cope with that problem has been to add uh, caches to processors uh, so that you can uh, avoid this long latency. But caches are very small and they also turned out to be not scalable. They do not grow, uh, for example, over the last uh, six years, um, the L1 cache, the fastest cache, uh, grown only by 25% or so. So these are really, really small memories, and the indexing data structure that spills out of those memory effectively go into the main memory, and there we all uh, understand that the latency is too high. So it is really difficult to scale those data structures, and the uh, memory latency is on the critical path, but what is really the, the, the bad news is that it's not only really hard to scale them today, it is likely to be hard to scale them in the future because there is so far no any clear way, uh, technological way to improve memory latency uh, for memories at large scale. Can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Aren't the indexes, uh, if the tree is normally very shallow, so, um, so you only have to get a few uh, go down the tree, I need two or three layers, and, uh, and you don't get much latency there? Well, the, the, the problem is that uh, the, the whole process of what is called latency, of what is called the pointer chasing, whenever you're going through the tree, your accesses to different tree layers are uh, quite often uh, fairly random. 
And because of the lack of locality, even though you don't have too many levels, the trees, if they're wide, you're going to get out of this fast caches. So the, the, the problem is not that much the, the, the depth, because that defines how many steps you go, but it's the fact that the accesses are random and, it is really, and there is no prefetch uh, strategy that can give you good results. And so the hardware is, uh, hardware prefetchers are useless. And the, your effective, uh, what is called working set is too large to fit in the cache. So in other words, you're saying that even if the query time or the access time is just one access, right, it doesn't matter that the depth is five or 10, even if it were just one, the fact that you're accessing a random location, this is what uh, makes uh, the efficiency really bad. Well, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, I, on the one hand, yes, but I, I'm not sure that I'm actually targeting this particular case because uh, uh, the, the, the thing is that when you're, whenever you're accessing your data, your data is anyway, I'm talking, remember, I'm talking about indexing data structure, right? So there are two parts, there is index, and there is the, the data itself. So you're going to, the data is so large that you're gonna get to, to access it in DRAM anyway. So the question is how many hopes do you get until you get to the actual data, right? And so if you get, if you, if you have one extra hop, it's probably not something that you can improve by, by much, even if you have super efficient index. But if you have four, five, six, then it accumulates apparently. And so then it becomes a problem. So it is very similar to the, to, to the concept of virtual memory, right? When, when you have a, a translation leukocyte buffer that, that helps you with saving uh, translations because otherwise you would need to go several hops until you, for every memory access, you would have to make four additional memory accesses just to get to the right memory, right? So that's, that, that's kind of a fundamental point. So if you, if you can cut the time to get to the data, right? Uh, th that is what we are trying to actually achieve. Okay. All right. So uh, this is where neural nets are are going to help us. And uh, let me just uh, uh, make a small disclaimer. These are not deep neural nets. These are shallow neural nets, and they are actually, you know, if I were talking to you about this algorithm twenty years ago, I wouldn't call it neural net at all. But uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't like, uh, um, I can't withstand this, the temptation to, to add this uh, cool buzzword on the title of my talk. So I'm gonna be talking about neural nets here. Okay, so, so what are we uh, talking here about? This is the, uh, the, the, the brief outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about a new type of algorithms that were introduced uh, in 2017 uh, by Tim Kraska from MIT that is called Learned Indexes. And we're going to take inspiration from, from these uh, data structures that actually use uh, neural nets to um, replace standard uh, tree-like data structures. Um, we are going to discuss why uh, learned indexes cannot be applied to the problem of uh, range matching. And then um, uh, we're going to talk about the algorithmic part, uh, what we call RQRMI. Uh, this is the model that, re that allows you to do um, um, range matching without uh, traversing this tree data structure. And uh, I will gonna show a real application and to the end evaluation of this idea. Um, and uh, we will show that uh, RQRMI beats all existing state-of-the-art algorithms uh, that were proposed for packet classification uh, by pretty significant margin. All right, so uh, let's talk about, let, about R uh, RMI, recursive model index. Um, the basic idea in uh, this uh, paper uh, is uh, to replace B trees with uh, neural nets. Okay, and the the the, uh, the the whole setup is that you have key value pairs, and um, and you want to somehow um, uh, make an efficient lookup uh, for all the keys. Okay, so so the idea to do that is to 
basically uh, not look at values at all, but look store the values in some kind of array and try to learn uh, the distribution uh, function between the key or basically the mapping function between the key and memory offset. Okay, and assuming that all the keys are ordered, um, assorted, uh, we know that memory offset is, is going to be a monotonic um, uh, rising function, increasing function. And we can uh, look at it, uh, if we are looking at it this way, we can try to learn an approximate representation of this function. And now it doesn't really matter how we do that, how we effectively represent this function in the end, but the really important part is that uh, this function, uh, assuming that we can learn it somehow, it would mean that we can replace the lookup uh, by uh, the computation of this function, okay? So this is kind of the, 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 the idea, the essence of this idea, given a, uh, an input key that you want to find the value for, you're going to uh, evaluate this key in this learned index, in this learned function. Uh, but this function is approximate, so how can you possibly get the right value, right? Because you're not, you're not guaranteed to get the right value. So how do you do that? And here is another interesting insight. If you can bound the error for the uh, prediction, okay, what it allows you to do is to know exactly the scope, how much you can search or perform the secondary search in order to find the real value. Okay, so the key idea is that given a model and given an error bound, which is tight and it's precise, we know exactly that if we are not going to find the right value within this bound, it means that there is no such a value in the data structure. So in this particular example, if uh, I provide X 68, the output is 102, 102, uh, that what is supposed to be, but my error is, uh, my, my model predicts that the memory offset is 104. But because I know exactly that I need to look, uh, to search, to perform secondary search, uh, at the radius of two, so it means that I need to scan through the values uh, surrounding uh, the offset 104, and here I will gonna find uh, the right match if there is such a key, and I will not gonna find that key if, if I'm not gonna find this key, then this key does not exist. Okay, so it's a really, really kind of simple idea. And assuming that we know the error, and this is a really strong assumption here, but assuming that we know the error as part of the whole learning process, uh, we can replace the key lookup with uh, a computation of the prediction. Okay, so that is the idea um, uh, for the RMI. And uh, the, the way uh, these guys decided to learn this uh, model or to represent this model is a hierarchy of uh, small submodels where um, every submodel is kind of trying to um, provide more expertise or provide more precise uh, prediction for a more for a smaller domain of inputs. So, for example, if I have input from zero to ten, um, I can kind of uh, simplistically assume that submodel uh, in stage one, uh, the leftmost submodel would be for uh, values between zero and two, and the, the rightmost will be for values between eight and 10. So again, this is, this is oversimplification. Apparently it's not necessarily a set of disjoint uh, ranges, but effectively what happens is that in order to uh, perform an inference in this, uh, in this uh, hierarchical model, what I'm doing is for every submodel I'm providing my X, and that selects the next submodel in the next stage to perform the next uh, inference. And eventually I get to the bottom where the leaf submodels give me the actual keys that eventually I gonna scan with the secondary search and find the right value. Okay. So again, the 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 there are probably many ways to learn this model in different 
in in a variety of ways. Um, in th in this particular paper, they decided to go for this hierarchical uh, model, and they also say that, for example, they can uh, use a neural net as a submodel, or they can use a bit tree as a submodel. Okay, so apparently they can use a bunch of other things. So, so again, what is really important here is that uh, this is a data structure that effectively uh, uh, going to learn the the district the, this key offset uh, mapping. And it is gonna overfit it, right? Because it's it's gonna be there's will be no generalization whatsoever. I'm going to uh, do what is more similar to memorization rather than the actual uh, learning with generalization. Because I'm gonna uh, build something that will know for every given p uh, the exact index of that p. Mark, so, there's a, there's yeah. a question. Uh, sure. The question is whether you need to store all the weights in the cache for uh, this whole model to be efficient. Oh yeah, yeah. So so that that brings me to the next uh, slide, and that's a that's a very timely question. So uh, this this is kind of the the bottom line, right? So this whole exercise would not have been interesting uh, without this nice results. So this model uh, allows you to compress your index by about two orders of magnitude and fit it all into the, um, uh, into the cache or at least stay within, within the cache, within L2 cache, core cache. And that allows you to uh, perform queries um, at about three times faster. Okay, so this is a real result for real database. So it's, it's already end-to-end. -end. It's not only the algorithm itself, it's actually the benefit of having this algorithm as part of the database. Okay, so this is really impressive, right? How long does um, training take? I'm sorry. How long does training take? Yeah, so so let's 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 uh, leave those kind of questions aside for now because uh, those are kind of crucial questions and and they are of of a uh, huge importance because it's not clear how you update this model. Apparently, there there are a lot of things that might. You know, we, we need to figure out how to do, and not all of them we know how to do, but the, the real cool part is that, you know, the, the benefits are pretty apparent. If and when all those constraints are resolved, you can get really nice results. Okay? So uh, what, what we kind of set out to do, we, we said, okay, so um, let's try to use RMI for uh, range matching, because uh, if it's such a cool model, uh, to, to use for uh, key value pairs. Maybe we can do the same with the range matching. So unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, and and uh, the, there are a few things which are, like one of them is really fundamental for, for the way RMI uh, is built. And um, so fundamentally, RMI requires to learn offsets for each key. And that is a real problem because um, if we assume that uh, the Stroman solution is just to, enumer to enumerate all the values in the range so that whenever we get a key that uh, is within the range, we would know where which, which offset the value, the, the corresponding value would be, uh, that would not work. Okay, that would not work because uh, the RMI model itself, in order to find the maximum error, it must scan all the keys in the input. Okay, because it's basically, it, it, it basically performs exhaustive search over all the keys that were provided in the input to, to estimate the maximum error. And as I already noted, it is impossible to use this RMI thing without having this error bound, which is precise because if it's imprecise, you would not know whether a piece of data is in the data set or not, right? So re recall that in order for us to return nil to fail to find some key, we need to have a strict bound on the error of the index that is predicted by the model. And for RMI, in order to know that error, they need to scan, to scan all the keys in the input. Now, this is the fundamental problem. It's a problem with the algorithm itself that RMI uses. 
The second problem is that if you're going to enumerate all the values in the range, you're going to uh, get too many values, okay? And this is gonna make the model so large that it would not make any sense to use it. And last but not least, uh, we don't know how to use uh, this model and handle overlaps because as I said, in certain application domains, and in particular in the one that we want to deal with, uh, there will be overlaps in the ranges. So how do we deal with those problems, right? So this is what we are uh, proposing in our work. Uh, we call our new model uh, range query recursive model index, RQRMI. And what it is able to do, it is able to perform matching of ranges. It's not trying to learn the keys, it's trying to learn ranges. It does handle overlaps uh, uh, in a very systematic way. And it also supports multidimensional ranges. And I will talk about all of those. And again, multidimensional ranges are really important for packet classification application, but they're also important for other cases like, uh, such as uh, sparse data structures. So RQRMI is gonna solve all those problems, but again, fundamentally, we're going to take advantage of very similar set of ideas that RMI used originally. So let's talk about RMI. Our first thing that we will do, we will assume that there will be no overlaps between the rules, and then we will add support to overlaps, okay? So the first thing that we do is that given a bunch of ranges, what we're going to do is we're going to sample the input domain and learn only valid inputs. For every, we're going to have a uniform sampling of all the values in all the ranges. And we're going to basically apply the RQRMI as if those were the keys and offsets for those keys. That will be our first thing that we will do. Now, the second thing, and this is the crucial part. The second thing that we will do, we are going to use very specific type of shallow neural net, which is MLP. Uh, it's basically a three-layer NLP with one hidden layer. Really, really simple. It's a regression uh, model fundamentally. And every hidden layer uh, node, every node in the hidden layer is a real node. Now, this is really, really important part because what this structure will allow us to do, it will allow us to achieve, uh, um, uh, it, it will allow us to provide a way very, very efficient way to um, compute the error. And this will be crucial because without that, we would not be able to uh, use this model. So how do we compute the error bound? So one thing to understand here is that what we really need to know is to know the error bound for the leaf nodes, because those are the nodes that actually provide the real, uh, the real output for the model. And here, once we have the um, um, MLP like this with ReLU, what we get is a piecewise linear function. And because we know that this is a piecewise linear function that effectively takes any X and maps it into some discrete domain of labels, it means that we can actually define a very few, set, a, a very clear and small set of points in which we need to, uh, to compute the output of the model in order to know the maximum error of the model. And in order to get the intuition, here's the idea. So let's assume that this is a model that we have. This is a leaf model. We have four, output uh, four values in the output domain, meaning that we are basically learning an array of size four. Okay, we have four ranges and we, they, play, they are stored in an array of size four. And we need to know for every X, which uh, range it belongs to, okay? So this is the model that we have. And for X, uh, let's say the one that is red here, we know that this X maps according to the model to the domain number one. Okay, now this is the trick that uh, 
uh, made the difference. In order to know how far this model from the, um, from the real um, set of ranges, all that we need to do is to find those vantage points that are exactly at the crossroad of the domains and finding the value of the model in these points will give us the maximum error bound on the model. And all of this can be computed analytically because again, this is really tiny MLP and, and uh, to know this error bound, uh, and, and there, there are very few um, linear equations that we need to solve in order to figure out uh, where these points are. So this is the key because instead of scanning the whole range, we just need to find those points and, and compute the error there. Okay. Once we understood that, I think that kind of, you know, the, 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 next, is, the next step is pretty clear. So here are how the whole training works. For each layer and each submodel, we uniformly sample the input domain of the model for those places where this input domain maps uh, matches the ranges. So what this means is that wider ranges will get more samples and na more narrow ranges will get fewer samples. Uh, then we train on these samples uh, and then we choose the next model to train on um, uh, for and, and define the input domain for the next layer. And essentially we get down to the leaf models and then we do this uh, error computations using vantage points. And once we find the, the error and we figure out that this error is below a certain threshold, we stop. But if, this threat, if we find that this model uh, has higher error than we want, then we add more samples. We can generate as many samples as we want on the fly. And then we retrain. And if eventually we get to the right level of, uh, of the accuracy, then we stop. If not, we increase the number of submodels in the model. Uh, this is a pretty uh, straightforward heuristics here. Um, more work has to be done to do it more systematically. But eventually we get this hierarchical model that is um, guaranteed to uh, output uh, the prediction with the uh, given uh, required error. And, and again, it is really important for that error also to be quite small because this is what defines the time it takes to perform secondary search. All right, so, so this is kind of the crucial part of our algorithm. And uh, to summarize, given that we don't care about overlaps for now, uh, this kind of model allows you to perform range matching and it has very effective training. Um, it, it allows very effective training. And it has correctness guarantees, apparently. Uh, we proved that in, in, in the paper as well. Okay, so what do we do with overlaps? Um, in order to deal with overlaps, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about multidimensional um, uh, space and overlaps together because it just uh, uh, fits nicely in the same story. So let's Mark, present. Uh, yes, question. How the dimension uh, come into play? Uh, like oh, so huge. Uh, it seems like hard to find those points which are close to the border. You mean? Are, are you talking about vantage points? Yeah. Uh, um, say it again, so I'm not, I'm not sure I, I understood so the question. Did you find those vantage points even in very high dimensions? No, 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 you don't need to. Because basically I'm going to explain how you're going to deal with dimensionality next, and you will see that we don't really need to deal with that. Oh. Okay. We, we basically sort of partition the problem into two independent sort of parts, uh, which is suboptimal, but it, 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 it gives uh, uh, the result that we want. So um, again, let's assume that we have a multi-dimensional problem and let's uh, take 2D ranges, for example. So um, uh, this, this is the example of 2D ranges, right? Where we, we, we have two variables and constraints on them. Now uh, let's have a uh, geometrical representation of the ranges because that will give us uh, some way to deal with them. So what we, what we want to do 
is to take this problem that has a lot of overlaps and, and multi-dimensions. And we want to now create multiple sub-problems where across a certain dimension, there will be no overlaps. And if that's what we will do, we will be able to learn each one of those sub-problems with a separate RQRMI model. And then when we want to perform the lookup, we will have to perform lookup across all these RQRMI models. Okay, so again, we are, we are breaking up this problem into independent problems without trying to handle them all in the same RQRMI. And so this is what we call ISET, um, independent sets, right? So again, the idea is to create a bunch of uh, subsets of these ranges uh, that do not overlap across a, a one dimension, okay? Because once we catch that, then we will be able to learn them. Apparently, we want to find as few as possible such uh, I sets and to cover all the rules with as few I sets as possible, which is again important because uh, this has direct implication on the complexity of the lookup. The more I sets you have, the more RQRMI's model the, you, you will have to compute, and that apparently. Uh, slows down the lookup. All right, so, so what is the idea? The idea is to use a heuristic. Um, uh, there is a actually optimal scheduling algorithm called interval scheduling optimization, uh, which allows you given a certain uh, set of uh, ranges, overlapping ranges, it allows to find the largest I set possible that covers the largest number of ranges. Unfortunately, it is not an optimal algorithm if you have more than one I set, right? Uh, for a single I set, it's optimal. For multiple, it's not. And we didn't try to improve it. Um, it, it can be done most likely. So the idea is that, uh, let me just quickly go over here. So if uh, we look at four at the ranges four, five, and six, uh, and, and three, those do not overlap across uh, X dimension, so we can put them into their own I set for uh, one, two, and five, uh, and seven, sorry. Uh, they do not overlap over Y. That what remain, that, that what uh, was left after the first I set. And now we have um, uh, the last one, which is a single I set, right? Single tone I set, rule eight. What do we do with that? Right? So apparently we, we don't want to learn uh, even tiny uh, subsets uh, with, uh, with separate RQRMI model. The, this is not gonna be efficient. So here, uh, this is a classical kind of uh, systems community um, thing, right? We, we say, oh, um, we, will, we have some leftovers, so let's just use some, something to, to index that. Because it's small, it will likely to be not the one that will dominate the runtime. So what we are gonna do, is we're gonna use any algorithm for remainder. Okay, so we, we, we're going to, to use RQRMI to learn large I sets, but we're going to use the regional algorithm to learn the remainder or to basically store the remainder. And we're gonna take advantage of that structure later because it's going to be very useful to support updates. Questions so far? Okay, great. So uh, let me kind of uh, tell you the complete story, right? So you have a uh, RQRMI um, that you're going to uh, find the prediction, then do the secondary search, and then validate that your um, uh, that that your range is indeed matching the input. The important part, though, is that if you have multiple ranges, and because we're creating I sets only for across one dimension, you would have to do validation for all the ranges given the certain input. So even if it is a matching input for a particular range that we found, it might be uh, not valid across other dimensions. And then we would not use it in the output. So to really summarize, we are going to have the input and then run it through 
all the subsets, all the I sets and the remainder, compute the uh, valid input and select the right one. Uh, this selection is necessary in order to select only one according to one criteria, but we, apparently we can return all the matching inputs as well. Now, why do we call our approach computational cache? The reason why we call it computational cache is that um, it can be viewed as a cache for the remainder. Assuming for a second that we don't need to go and look up the remainder because for certain domains, we can ensure that finding the first match would be sufficient. In this case, those ISATs behave as if it was a computational cache for the as a cache with very fast lookup for the small portion of data that is left in the remainder. That is the analogy that we found to be pretty instructive to explain what we are actually doing. Any questions? Okay, great. So again, on the paper, it looks nice. Uh, but uh, does it really work, right? And, and here I'm going to show you pretty quickly um, how we implemented it for packet classification. And then I will talk a little bit more about other uh, applications that um, it can be useful for. So what is packet classification? Packet classification is a very basic operation done by all network switches and firewalls and, and routers and, and other network devices that basically pass packets from one destination to another. They, they need to know where to pass the packet. And packet classification is defined as a set of rules according to packet headers. For example, I want to say that all the packets that come from a particular IP, from a particular machine, and go into a particular machine uh, and according to a certain destination ports, if these all things um, are satisfied, then the action for that packet is to forward it to port one. And the interesting part here is that there could be many rules that match a certain packet or match a certain packet, but I would need to choose the one that has the highest priority. Okay. Um, so as you can see, this problem fits nicely into the multidimensional range query with overlapping ranges, right? So this is, this is, this is exactly what, what I've been talking about because you have a nice uh, wildcards here that are apparently defining the range, same as numerical range for ports, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So over the years, there have been quite a few uh, efforts to do that efficiently using hardware, uh, but we're not going to take a look at the hardware. We're going to look for now, at least, only at the software part. And this is also very important for modern data centers. So what is the real problem? The real problem is that it works nicely as long as you have few rules, but in modern systems, you might get half million or even million rules and then uh, the whole system becomes bottlenecked at the CPU. So um, this is exactly where RQRMI should, should solve the problem. But now let me show you something that is really um, illustrative for what is going on. So we're taking a state-of-the-art algorithm to store the rules. And here the, the, on the x-axis, we show the number of rules we're trying to store in this data structure that is called tuple merge. And on the left side, you can see uh, on the y-axis, you can see the size of the data structure, of the indexing data structure, not the data itself, on the indexing data structure. And what you can see here is that uh, for 10K rules, then the indexing data structure is already in L2 cache. And for 100 and 500 key, um, uh, it's gonna go grow out of L2 and almost scratches the L3. And uh, mind the exponential scale of the y-axis. Now, if we look at the performance of this thing, and you can see it on the right, 
the, you, you can see very, very clear correlation between the performance and the size of the data structure, okay? And apparently it's not as nice for all rule sets. We found really one that, 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 that goes really nice, that shows really nicely our point, but you can see that the throughput of the system goes down linearly as the number of rules um, goes high, okay? So that is why we need something that works better than, than, than the existing algorithms. Okay, so this is where we uh, build NuvoMatch. Uh, this is a, an algorithm that is um, using RQRMI for packet classification. And uh, it works roughly like this. You take the rules, you uh, basically translate them into ranges, then apply ISET algorithm and uh, create the ISETs with the remainder. Uh, apparently you filter all the tiny ISETs and say that those ISETs should be above certain size um, uh, in order to make sense to index them with RQRMI. And then you place the rest in the remainder and remainder you can, you can use it with any kind of algorithm that already available today to perform the same thing. And now let me show you the size comparison. Um, so um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of uh, state-of-the-art algorithms. Let's start from cut split. This is the algorithm that represents the rules as a kind of decision tree, if you will. And uh, what we are comparing here is the size of the original uh, index using cut split. This is the blue uh, bar. And then we have uh, the RQRMI, which is the bottom side, and the remainder, which is the top side. Okay, so the, the RQRMI size is almost always in L1 cache because it's a bunch of models that fit all in L1. And then there is a remainder that does not fit into L1, uh, but it is still much smaller. Again, mind the exponential scale of the y-axis. Now, what I'm gonna show you now is a uh, graph with comparison for different state-of-the-art algorithms, cut, split, nor cuts, and tuple merge. And the remainder in each one of the uh, bars that represents RQRMI the remainder is using the algorithm that is, uh, uh, that is that we are comparing with. So for example, in the uh, leftmost bar, uh, the tuple merge, uh, I'm sorry, cut split is used as a remainder. And in, in, in this, in the, in the dark blue, tuple merge is used as a remainder. And what we can see here is that the compression ratio uh, for the uh, rule set is pretty tremendous, right? You can see that we never cross the bar of L2 cache. And mind you, L2 cache is, is, is the kind of cache that is still sitting in the same CPU core. It doesn't cross out of core versus L3 cache, which is 10X slower than, than L1, for example. So you can see that uh, the, the space improvements are dramatic. And um, this is on its own very, very nice uh, feature that we get here. But now whether we can take advantage of the space improvements in terms of the end-to-end -end performance, that is where the interesting part is. And Mark, Mark yes. how do you explain that they became more efficient when more uh, constraints were in the system, more rules on the right oh, side? So, so this is highly nonlinear problem. It's, it, it does not, uh, you know, it, it is not easy to, like, we're trying to simplify it by just saying here are many rules and these are few rules and that is the only, uh, that is the only criteria. Uh, but this is actually very simplistic. So for different data sets, for different rule sets, we found that uh, while there is a correlation between the size of the rule set and the size of the data structure, it's not necessarily so, you know, clear. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily so simple. Uh, so yes, it, it definitely depends on the rule set. So we talk a little bit about it in the paper. We explain what would take more and what would take less space. So 
Another question is whether neural net inferences is, is slow. And the answer is that if you have such a talented student as Alon and, 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 and you use the right type of networks, then the inference is just a bunch of instructions, basically few instructions that need to run. And because the data is in L1, uh, it takes really no time. So the, we, we managed to accelerate from a 125 nanosecond to, to 40, 50 nanosecond per inference, per, per uh, lookup um, in RQRMI by using vector instructions. So let me skip that. This is actually an interesting slide, but I will, I will not have time to talk about it. It's talking about ISET compute versus coverage, how many ISETs you need you will, you will be able to look at it later. The really interesting part is what do you do about updates, right? The rules get updated and the model needs to be retrained. How, how, do, we, how do we deal with that? And here is where remainder comes very handy because we can add new rules into the remainder and then retrain whenever we have enough rules in the remainder. Of course, the, the result is that if we use slow training, our AND throughput is going down because we need to look up the remainder. And so we are kind of having the cache miss. But once the retraining is over, we bump up the throughput again. And so if you keep updating the rules all the time, your throughput kind of fluctuates from high to low, from high to low. Um, but it's pretty clear that you really want to get fast training. And in our paper that we published in SICOM, we showed that 500 rules can run um, training uh, from 10 to 40 minutes. Uh, and we managed to justify it in certain use cases, but apparently it was very restricted. In our recent work that is now under uh, review, we showed that we can improve that time by three, four orders of magnitude by improving the training algorithm uh, to perform some, some approximations. And although we would still allow very fast lookup, we would achieve very, very fast training that would get us to about 10 millisecond to one second of training, meaning that we can update up to 50 K rules per second, which is basically a really, really high number that is rarely necessary in practice. So again, I, I can go over the evaluation. I really uh, would, would suggest to go to, to read the paper for really kind of comprehensive evaluation that we did. Um, just one, you know, kind of figure there, there are different rule sets. Uh, this is the y-axis. And uh, those rule sets are uh, kind of standard um, benchmarks for uh, classifiers in the field. And what we can see is the actual throughput that we get uh, compared to state-of-the-art algorithms. Um, and these are, um, uh, th th these are basically, they have been considered state-of-the-art and, and they used pervasively. Um, and it was really difficult to improve over them. So I think that this is a really important achievement here. So let me skip quickly to the future work. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take just three more minutes to, uh, to talk about it. Um, the, the key point here is that we want to make models updatable, right? And, and uh, this is not trivial because for now, the way these models are built actually require to retraining them from, from sketch, from scratch. And retraining them from scratch can be expensive for a larger number of rules. So we really want them to be updatable. That's what we're gonna do in our future work. But so far, uh, we took the algorithm uh, from a complete theory or so, so, so theory in practice, basically that I showed before, which was invoked standalone compared with other algorithms. And we integrated it into a real system used in production. And there we managed to break some kind of algorithmic barrier that this system experienced with existing state-of-the-art algorithms. And we managed to improve it by far more than the factor that we expected because what the algorithm allows us to do, it allows us to perform much more powerful matching 
uh, um, than uh, in the original system and improve the system performance by sometimes factor of 25. So what I'm trying to say is that the improvements that we can, with, that we can uh, get from the algorithm are not necessarily uh, incremental compared to the original, but they allow us a different trade-offs in this design space for real systems. And by doing that, we can exploit um, the power of the algorithm in different ways. So that is really, uh, uh, in, in, in my view, this is really important result because just thinking about these factors of 2.5 or 4, like this is not the way to think about. It. We really need to kind of take the problem as a whole as a system and try to think how to leverage the power of this new algorithm. And in this context, I want to mention a few other interesting research directions that uh, we are now working on. Uh, one is hardware acceleration. We really want this uh, whole ArcUrmi thing to run in hardware uh, so that we can plug it into CPU um, uh, hardware or GPU or any other platforms that uh, would eventually allow to improve the virtual memory model. It would allow much more flexible handling of sparse data structures. Uh, it would allow some completely bizarre design decisions that were dismissed because there was no indexing data structure that would allow them, for example, variable size pages in virtual memory that would be very beneficial in certain domains in certain cases, but, but the, 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 these were unthinkable before um, uh, because of the complexity of the data structure itself. Um, we can think about um, getting rid of Radix tree altogether because uh, it would make probably much more space efficient um, uh, data structures. Uh, we are thinking about implementing those things in programmable switches to allow uh, more power of this algorithm be available to people who work in in, in, in switching and firewalls and, and other things. And we're, you know, we, we are looking for new applications. And uh, I think that there are a lot to be done here uh, to explore this, uh, this topic. Now, uh, to conclude, um, ArcRMI is the way to use neural nets to scale a uh, range uh, matching. Um, Nuva match is one kind of particular point in this design space applied, apl which applies ArcUrmi to uh, packet classification, and it does so very convincingly. Um, apparently, this is the first application. More will come, um, and I really hope that um, you know this this kind of work will generate more interest in in this new type of data structures. Um, that use neural nets for uh, coping with scalability problems. Um, this is it. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Mark. Uh, so I'll give you a quick round of applause. Um, does anybody have a quick question? Feel free to jump in. Okay, if not, then uh, we'll thank Mark again. It was a pleasure. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank and you. hope to see you all next week. Thanks.